Hello and welcome to the Back to Being podcast, where I speak with experts, practitioners, and everyday people about living a more healthy, active, and mindful life. My name is Kareem Rushdie, and I've spent over a decade learning to transform my own chronic pain and stress so I can lead a life worth living. Now I'm using what I've learned along the way, as well as the knowledge and experience of my guests, to share unique perspectives that can help you do the same. Thank you for tuning in today. In this episode, I speak with chartered psychologist, nutrition expert, author, and advocate for a whole body approach to mental health and well being, Kimberly Wilson. Kimberly is a psychologist with a master's degree in nutrition and the author of How to Build a Healthy Brain, published in 2020, and Unprocessed How the Food We Eat is Fueling Our Mental Health Crisis, published in 2023. She has a private practice in central London has served in the British National Health Service as a governor of a mental health trust, and she also previously led the therapy service at Europe's largest women's prison. In this episode, Kimberly and I discuss why the way we think about mental health, as separate from physical health, is seriously flawed. We talk about the importance of whole body mental health that factors in nutrition and lifestyle, and specifically how they impact the brain. Kimberly's training, knowledge, and experience in these areas is incredible, and her passion for whole body mental health is infectious. I learned so much from our conversation and hope you do too. Without further ado, here's Kimberly Wilson on whole body mental health. Enjoy. Okay, Kimberly, thank you so much for sharing your time with me and for accepting my invitation that I'm sure came out of the blue. (laughs) My pleasure. No, my pleasure. Yeah, really excited about the conversation we're going to have today. There's a lot of things I want to talk to you about. We'll see how much of that we can cram in um, to the hour. Your two books in and of themselves are just so, they're connected, of course, but there's just so much interesting stuff there. So we'll try and get to to both of those. And maybe to start with, your first book, How to Build a Healthy Brain, include a lot of advice around kind of lifestyle medicine, preventative, or sometimes called integrated medicine. So, mm-hmm. you know, some, some of the pillars you talked about were, were nutrition and sleep and, and exercise and, and meditation. So one of the things I want to ask you, which I ask a lot of the guests on this podcast right off the bat is, and I will come back to nutrition a bit later, but when it comes mm-hmm. to meditation and then more broadly speaking, mindfulness, mm. what do these practices mean to you and how do they show up in your life before we get to perhaps how they help you work with the people that you that you work with? I guess fundamentally, if I were to boil it down, it's about having the tools or acknowledging that sometimes your brain does dumb stuff. And you can just ignore it. You know, it's the ability to create a little bit of space between what emerges from your brain and how you respond to it. And for most of us, for most people, we have this kind of fusion between me and my thoughts. You know, I am what I think and what I think is who I am. And once you understand a little bit about how the brain works, you you realize that that's really not true. (laughs) It's really not true. Sometimes your brain, I I love the brain. I think it's beautiful. It's wonderful. It's complex. It's incredible. But sometimes it just does unhelpful, dumb stuff. And you need to be able to kind of bear that, tolerate it, be curious about it, but then also be able to choose whatever response to it that is best for you. So I think whatever you call it, introspection, meditative practice, mindfulness, it's about creating that little bit of space between what emerges from your brain and then what you choose to do with it. Mm, yeah, no, I love that. Viktor Frankl talks about, you know, creating space between stimulus and response. Mm-hmm. And that stimulus could be internal. It could be thought, emotion that, as you say, we often identify with, but it can also be external. It could be something somebody else said mm-hmm. or, or, you know, an event that, that we encounter. And, and when we've got that space and we can consciously respond rather than habitually react it does have a, a great effect uh, on us i've heard it said once you, know, you use the the word brain but i've heard it said um you know if your mind if, once you stop and you observe and you take a bit of time you know to meditate or just to to observe your thoughts without getting kind of drawn into the content you realize that if your mind was a person it's not somebody you take much advice from <laughs> oh not at all you wouldn't invite them to dinner you wouldn't hang out with them they'd be saying all sorts of random stuff and silly observations in inane thoughts all the time 
yeah, yeah. And, uh, having having you act on the the craziest of impulses as well. Exactly. You know? but there's something a bit deeper there as well. I mean, you said to you know learn to meet those activities of mind with with curiosity, with mm. a bit of distance between you and them. I'm wondering if there's something you you know you talk about in your clinical practice. I think the other thing that's quite important for for people to to bear in mind is that however crazy the mind seems, however illogical or irrational those thoughts are, when you realize that the mind is just trying to keep you safe and it's mm. still stuck on those old kind of patterns of survival and, you know, accumulating as many resources as you can, you can even meet it with a little bit of humor. You know, I, I often will thank my mind for going where it's gone and have a little chuckle about where it's gone and, and just let it, I'm okay, I'm safe. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. I mean, that is the other thing is, it's just, it's doing its very best. And so, sometimes you think, oh, that's so sweet that you thought that was a good idea. You thought that that was a reasonable, that's really adorable. I love you for that, but we're not going to do that anymore. And I think that is a really important thing because, you know, I see memes and I find them funny. People are like, my brain, my number one enemy. And I can understand what they mean. But I think when you come from a position that your brain is doing its very best, there are a lot of inputs there's a lot of information both externally and internally I think that's one of the things that we miss is that there's a huge amount of information coming from your body all the time that your brain is trying to make sense of and so the state and condition of your body is going to be informing your thoughts and your feelings and too often we neglect our bodies and that becomes part of this kind of ongoing malaise I think for a lot of people but if you take it from a position of curiosity and compassion then you can start to have a bit of relationship with your mind and it can make some of the responses less frightening. So just there was an example that I, I put on my social media because I think it really it could, was helpful for people that someone had asked a question on my Instagram and they'd said, you know, why is it that years after my divorce from an, an abusive partner, I still get terrified every time I see them it's it's years later I don't live with them anymore but I still get this terror response you know and and I wanted to point out first of all a that that's a very common reaction for a lot of people it's very understandable mm -hmm. and second that it's not a sign necessarily that you're broken that you've been irreparably damaged by this relationship that that you're weak that's none of those things it's about how your brain is trying to keep you safe that your brain mm. your mind has made associations in the past between this person and threat in your mind this person is a risk to you and it will galvanize and generate all of those fear fight flight freeze responses Man. It will do that to keep you safe, to keep you ready the next time. And because you had such a successive long-term experience with that, that's all the data your brain has about this person. And what you need now is just to update the data. It's going to take a little while, but you need to just a update that data so that your brain can begin to understand that the next time and the next time and the next time you encounter that person, you're not in danger anymore. And it's just mm. about a matter of almost a kind of the probabilities, a statistical relationship. Your brain is making a prediction of harm and over time it will stop making that same prediction. And I think just framing it like that for a lot of people can help people to feel less angry with themselves or, or less disappointed in themselves, less like they're failing. Actually, it's your brain doing its very best to keep you safe. And, and absolutely, you can go, thank you, brain. I loved you for that. Thank you for that. Let's see what we can do to kind of shift this prediction that you're making. Yeah, I love that. I love that because it is helping people not to stand in opposition to those thoughts, not to stand in opposition to their brains, their minds. Because when we do, friction gets created. We suppress whatever we're thinking or feeling mm -hmm. and it does come back to haunt us. So kind of meet it. We talk a lot in, you know, in teaching mindfulness about meeting experience as it mm -hmm. is. That's a wonderful place to to start. Kind of connected question then. When, how much do you use meditation, mindfulness in your clinical practice? And what kind of, you know, what kind of effects do you see? What kind of benefits do you see for people who do take up such practices uh, after they come in and start working with you? So I suppose the first thing is that I don't use it for everyone. And I suppose the, mm. that's partly because I don't think it's right for everyone, certainly not at the outset. And certainly when I was working with very traumatized populations, staying with your feelings 
was just a terrible idea. Yeah. <laughs> when you when your history is of abuse, violence, harm, then the a you perhaps haven't learned the capacity to tolerate your thoughts and feelings. And that's partly because B, your body has been in such a survival mode that you haven't had that cognitive, reflective, introspective opportunity. And -hmm. therefore you don't learn the tools to be able to bear them and then to behave safely. So, and, and that was one of the things that came up when, you know, when there was that kind of big wave of mindfulness in the kind of general social conversation and people were recommending it for everything. And there were a group of us psychologists who were like, we need to be very careful about who we're suggesting should try this. And we shouldn't be telling people to just, you know, off you pop, sit down quietly, <laughs> think about your thoughts by yourself. It's not a silver bullet. It's, it's not, not a, a panacea. Bullet, but, you know, there's, there's more than one way to observe a thought. So for, for when I do use it, it's often when people... I've built up enough of a relationship with them. They trust me enough to help guide them through it. And it's partly, it's particularly useful for people with IBS. So I see people with irritable bowel syndrome, which is very interesting functional gut disorder, because quite often what happens, because IBS is a stress sensitive disorder, stress is really key to a lot of the symptomology. And what the, my anecdotal observation is that A lot of people with IBS are introverts who have found themselves in an extrovert situation. Mm. And so they're always overriding, override, 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 override. And so I will use uh, a few techniques to help them just to stop and come down and, you know, think about where you feel safest and what feels good for you and what you feel in your body when you think about giving a presentation and, and those sorts of things. So helping to bring the observation back inwards or also when people are perhaps relaying a very difficult experience and the thing about psychotherapy is unfortunately the way our brains are wired is it's you can't really process an emotion without reliving it a little bit as well you have to we can't just like think about it and oh that was that was very interesting and it's a a purely cognitive experience there is a little bit of, of a reliving And so I will use mindfulness techniques to help people just recognize and stay grounded where they are whilst they might be revisiting quite difficult feelings. And again, that's Mm. about retelling the story and letting the mind, the brain know that it's safe whilst it can encounter these very difficult thoughts. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We refer to it as re-perceiving or de-centering sometimes. Just putting, Mm -hmm. again, it's coming back to space, putting a little bit of space between you and and those sorts of emotions. Fantastic. You alluded earlier to the amount of information that's coming uh, from our bodies that we're often not attuned to. I think we're much more familiar with the idea that when we're stressed out, when we're feeling, you know, thinking negatively, that can affect our bodies. I think we're much less attuned to the, the fact that there could be underlying discomfort or issues in the body that are having a huge effect on our, on our thoughts and emotions. Mm. Um, so I think it's a really nice segue into whole body mental health. <laughs> um, and uh, see how I did that? See, yeah, I love very, that. Very, so smooth. Very, so good. very smooth. Very smooth. <laughs> um, I want to know how you, because you came to this conclusion some years ago, and I want to mm. know how you came to this conclusion that kind of mainstream thinking, the mainstream approach to managing, mitigating mental health um, challenges was flawed. And then how did this whole body mental health philosophy emerge out of that conclusion? Mm. The thing with this question is, is everything seems very neat in retrospect, doesn't it? Everything was like it lined <laughs> up. And so I was kind of tell this story like, well, first I did this and then I did that. But I'm sure... Give us the messy, give us the messy <laughs> version. Messy give up. us the messy version. Um, the, I suppose a lifelong interest in brains and, being, and, and the idiosyncrasies of them and how two people can see the same thing, but respond to it very differently, which you just think, oh, why, why, you know, if we've all got the same brain, you know, in the same way that we all have the same kind of heart, you know, a mm-hmm. heart surgeon goes in knowing what to expect, your, your ventricles are in roughly the same place, like, why is it that we have these different responses? So uh, that interest in psychology, where I think it's synthesized was when I was working in prisons. Mm-hmm. And so I'd had this grounding in, in psychology and psychotherapy and early life and the importance of the early relationship. 
And then I'd had this personal interest in nutrition. And then the there was a replication of a study that came out, which looked at the, it was an intervention study, an RCT, so randomized controlled trial, placebo controlled, double blinded. So really what would be considered the gold standard in terms of demonstrating causality. And so what they did, and it was in a male prison, I was working in a woman's prison, but in, in a male prison, a young offenders institute, improving nutritional status and it was through supplementation so one group got the supplements and the other group got a placebo improving nutrition status in these violent male prisoners reduced objective incidence of violence in the prison by over 30 percent wow and i was running a therapy service at the time the women i was working with had experienced enormous trauma some of them were incredibly violent Keeping them safe was my main priority, as well as keeping my team safe, mm. as we were working with them in kind of quiet rooms on the end of a wing. So managing safety and being aware of risk was part of my remit. And I'd had all of this training in, in risk and safety and violence, which said things like, you know, previous history and, you know, trigger events. And are there any upcoming anniversaries and people become anxious before their next court date? And all of that stuff is true. There hadn't been a single conversation about that person's physical status mm. and in this case their nutritional status and the mm. impact that that might have on their behavior on their mood on the, the way that they might interact with someone the way that they might be interpreting the world and it just kind of struck me because it, because it was so resonant with the work I was doing I was like hold on a minute <laughs> we we have all of these people coming in to give courses which haven't been accredited we're not sure they really work they're very expensive they don't give us the outcomes that we need frankly and yet we have and this was a replication we have at least two rcts demonstrating the same magnitude of effect that just improving nutrition makes this place much less dangerous mm. why are we not why a why are we not doing anything about it but also what does this tell us about how the mind functions what does this mm. tell us about the assumptions that we make about volition and behavior and mood that we integrate, that we associate just with personality and that we separate from what's happening in the rest of the body? And so that's what got me started. I was like, OK, <laughs> let's see. Yeah, this idea that personality is something that is just up here in our heads, behind our mm. eyes, and it all it all comes from there. I mean, it, re it reminds me, you remember the, the, some years ago, Jamie Oliver went on a crusade to try and improve nutrition in schools. And, the, and mm -hmm. there was all these examples of schools that had a lot of, you know, so-called mm -hmm. problem children, mm -hmm. children with learning difficulties, pull out the junk food and everything changed. Their behavior changed, their academic performance changed, mm -hmm. their mood changed. So you had, you had this kind of this, this realization that that's step one. How did you then try to mainstream <laughs> this idea and and convince people whether it be in, in institutions like prisons and healthcare systems oh. or just your colleague just your colleagues in, in well, psychology I mean I didn't for a long time so it got me started in terms of research at that point I'd had a kind of lay interest in nutrition but afterwards I okay I need to do a master's in this and I need to do a master's in nutrition that focuses on nutrition and the brain specifically so mm. I did that and then along the way, you, you kind of find all of this other interlinking research. It was at the same time that the research into the gut microbiome was starting to blossom and right. all of the stuff that's coming out of UCC in, in Ireland. And then also, I think an, another really key part of the journey for me was the research on emotion granularity and valence. So, uh, Do you want to el elaborate a yes, little bit? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So... We, Sounds granular. It's, it's it's so interesting and it's so important to to my work as a psychologist because when I was and I literally remember being set this as one of my essays in my psychology undergrad, which was about the question was how can you spot a liar and it was talking about emotions and micro expressions, and at the time the thinking the the dominant thinking had been that there were these key human emotions that are universal so happiness surprise fear blah blah that are absolutely universal, kind of baked in. And, and then there are these few extra ones along the way. And th this had been what we were being taught. And then this new field of research said, actually, I don't think that's the case at all. That's mm. really not how it works because 
what we see cross-culturally is that there are different meanings associated with the positioning and it, the, the, the language is very careful it's kind of like I can't remember the terminology it's like facial positioning like actually the kind of what your face is doing and what you're doing at that point when you're looking at somebody else's face is that you're not getting a true representation of what they're feeling you are making an assumption based on that facial configuration your previous experience and what your culture tells you that facial yeah. configuration means right right and and that that then overlies with the information coming from your body. So the example that I give, because it, it does start to feel very complicated, and I think there are two ways that make this feel a bit more accessible for people. So the first one is that, you know, you're standing on the edge of a cliff, right? The wind is rushing past your face. How are you feeling? And I think a lot of people would assume I'm afraid, <laughs> you know, I'm on mm -hmm. the edge of a cliff, I'm pretty frightened. And that expectation that prediction of a fear response and it's you know it's associated with your a stomach that's kind of there's butterflies and your heart is pounding and when you tell people that edge of a cliff butterflies heart pounding people say oh fear for sure yeah. um and then i say okay but you have a parasail on you've mm. been paragliding for 10 years you're with 15 of your best friends on a beautiful sunrise morning. Now, how do you feel? Mm. Same sensations, same butterflies in your stomach, same heart palpitation. And then they say, oh, exhilarated, excited, ready to go. And so that's just a very kind of crude example that the same sensations, once you have different contextual information, shifts the meaning of the emotion. So it's mm. not that butterflies in your stomach all, always mean that you're afraid. Butterflies can mean whatever you think it means, depending on your contextual information. And that context can be where you are, who you're with, or your previous history. So there's that part. So that, and that's the part that brings in the what we call valence, which is the information coming from your body becomes interpreted by your brain. Mm -hmm. But also that sense of pleasantness or unpleasantness is happening on an unconscious level for most people most of the time. So yeah. you when it's conscious, like, you know, you can be walking down the road. It's quite a nice sunny day today, right? And you're you're walking down the road. Maybe you had a lovely yoga session. You've had a beautiful meditation morning. Everything's feeling great. But you've got new shoes on. And they're just a little bit pinchy and a little bit sore. Yeah. And a bit unpleasant down there. It's yeah. a little yeah. bit unpleasant. You've got a stone in your shoe. And that can just irritate you. It can make you a bit grisly, a bit grumpy. Nothing else is objectively wrong with what's happening in your life. But this state of physical discomfort is experienced and interpreted as an instance of bad mood. Mm -hmm. So I think most people get that. And then what I say is you can be having an instance of discomfort that is below your level of conscious awareness. It yeah. can be an, a virus or infection. So often people's mood will drop when they're coming down with the flu as a mm -hmm. pre-symptom before their noses get stuffy. Especially mm. especially when they're seven and nine-year-old girls. Ooh, I can there you to go. That. And yeah. so you can yeah. see, you can see, you're like, oh, something's going on with <laughs> yeah, you. Yeah, something's up, yeah. It can be inadequate nutrition, nutritional deficiencies. It could be inflammation. So a long-standing injury that hasn't been dealt with. It could be something you've eaten that just isn't you know, sitting right with you. It could be blood sugar. It could be all sorts of things that your brain is receiving a message from your body saying something's not right. Something's not right. Something's not right. Something's not right. But because it's below that level of conscious awareness, your brain will be like, Something feels really bad. What is it? What is, is it my relationship? Am I dissatisfied with work? Maybe, you, you, right? Because your brain, yeah. your brain will look for something to hang that feeling of discomfort on. And that's why whenever I'm working with someone, we deal with those physical foundations first. Let's not assume that this maybe poor mood that you're presenting with is some sign of some terrible thing that's happened to you. Let's deal with the things that we can tick off first, make sure you're slept well, making sure you're 
well nourished, making sure that you're getting physical activity, morning sunlight. And if then this persists and to the same degree, then we can start doing some more exploratory work. But let's not ignore the uh, influence of the body on how you're experiencing your psychological mm. symptoms. I've been talking for ages. <laughs> no, it's it's fascinating. And it's, you know, it really just ties back into to the mindfulness piece because that valence that what you know what we sometimes call feeling tone every mm. single sensory impression we have whether consciously or unconsciously is registered as pleasant mm. unpleasant or, or neutral right mm. when it's unpleasant we have that aversive kind of reaction and it may be beneath the surface and it may cause us to act speak think in a in a way that we're you know not sure where that came from and anything that's pleasant we kind of want to cling on to it. Then we get, you know, gri gripped with fear that it's going to end and, and that sensation is going to dissipate. But if you're not attuned, and I think this comes back to whole body mental health, if you're not attuned to your body, if you're not embodied at any you know mm -hmm. given time, you're, you may not be even aware that that stone is in the shoe, that there's inflammation mm -hmm. in the gut, that you're not getting enough of, of, of a certain vitamin or, or mm. mineral. So I, I can totally relate to that. So, I mean, how does that... How does that translate over then into, so you wrote a book on this as well. <laughs> yeah. This is, the, this is the, 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 the latest book. We've got to do another shout out for that. Unprocessed, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Un yes. well, I, I've got the full, how the food we eat is fueling our mental health crisis. I think that's what you've given. You've given one example of how not getting the right nutrition mm. may be causing discomfort in the body, which then manifests in the mind and in the heart in, in terms mm -hmm. of emotions. What are some of the other ways that nutrition impacts the brain and then goes mm. on to impact impact mental health I think that'd, that'd be really interesting for people to, to hear sure i think it starts from something's going to sound really obvious but your brain is made of food <laughs> we, kind, we kind of forget we forget that we are made of food that yeah. we are composed as babies from the little broken down fragments of whatever it was our mothers were eating in utero this bit of me is chicken wing and this bit of me is a baked bean, you know, that we are composed of these fractions of, of food. But I think the relationship between food and brain health, food and mental health really starts back there. You know, and mm. people start, you know, they, they will come to me in kind of midlife and say, what about now? And yes, we can do things now. But I, I guess I want to get across this message of, of prevention and proactive interventions so we know, for example, so if you're an architect or you're, you're a builder and I set, sent you off to build a house and I gave you the schematics and the plan and I gave you the piece of land, what you would need are the right materials, right? It wouldn't help if I gave you a bunch of washing up sponges and said, make me a lovely house, please, mm. because they are roughly the right shape, but they're the wrong material. They're not going to do what we need it to do. So when it comes to the brain, there are some key nutrients that are absolutely essential materials for building the brain. They, they are the omega-3 fatty acids, particularly DHA, another one called arachidonic acid, a fatty acid. Iodine is required to make thyroid hormone, which kicks off the development of the organs in utero and really determines the neuronal density of the brain. And we know that because in regions where there is iodine deficiency, usually inland, landlocked areas, there is long-term chronically suppressed IQ in the population. Mm. Iodine is considered by the World Health Organization to be the leading cause of preventable brain damage worldwide. Wow. So, wow. Where do we get our iodine from? No, um, not, it's, it's richest in seafood. Um, mm -hmm. And then fish and seafood. So again, it really, and along with omega-3, which is found in oily fish, it really leans into this understanding that for a big chunk of our development as human beings, as modern human beings, we were coastal or lakeshore dwelling because we yep. needed these preformed omega-3s and this iodine and choline, which is also found in, in fish and, and animal foods to build our very, very hungry brains that are too yeah. big for our bodies, really. Compared to other yeah. land mammals, our brains are much bigger than they should be because of the energy uh, consumption. But it means that we must have had access to these key nutrients in abundance in order to be able to build these brains. So DHA, iodine, choline, which is found in liver, egg yolks, salmon, fish, and, and kind of animal products, pork. and 
these are the the kind of limiting factors. So we know that when you, in animal studies, when you deprive a mother of omega-3 in her diet, her baby's brain, if you look at the brain cells in the hippocampus, there are 50% fewer connections than wow. if you make sure she has sufficient omega-3 in the diet. So the amount, the availability of some of these nutrients are actually limiting to the structure. So it's like me saying, off you go, build a, a lovely house for me, but I'm only going to, I'll give you some bricks, but only about two thirds of the number of bricks that you need. Mm -hmm. You might be able to build a structure, but it's not going to be anywhere near as resilient and up to the task as it might be if I gave you everything you needed. So I think it starts there. It starts preconception in utero with actually the very, very foundations of what we're building in our children and young people. And then it's onwards. Like things that take care of your brain are the polyphenol compounds that keep the blood vessels ha happy. There are 400 miles of blood vessels in your brain in order to fuel those very, very hungry cells. And you need those blood vessels to be flexible, happy, healthy, in order to make sure that there aren't any blockages, because blockages is what's associated with strokes and TIAs. Leafy green vegetables in a study that looked at elders who reported eating leafy greens every day. The ones who ate them every day had brains that were 11 years younger than those who reported not eating leafy greens on a daily basis. So Amazing. Yeah. The, it's these whole foods. And this is the issue is it's not that a single and I, I don't make the claim anywhere that a single chocolate bar is going to be deteriorous to your, your brain health and that you're you know, you're going to be doing yourself harm. But when we look at what our brains need and what the average, not I was going to say average adult, but actually this extends to children even more so. So the average adult in the UK is consuming somewhere in the region of 50, 55% of their energy from ultra processed foods. For 20% of UK children, that's 78% of their daily calories come from ultra processed foods. And what we know about that is that because when you process an ingredient into its constituent parts, you lose much of the micronutrient content. Yeah. The higher your intake of UPF, the lower your nutritional status, including vitamins A, B3 and 12, which are essential to neuronal health, vitamin C, D, E, your omega-3, selenium, zinc, phosphorus, iron. So the higher your intake of these foods, the lower your nutritional status and the less access your very hungry, nutrient demanding brain has to what it needs to function well. So that is, I think, where I start with, uh, other, you know, other people will kind of also then talk about the role of emulsifiers on the gut microbiome. And, and I think that's all interesting and putative, but fundamentally, we're trying to build houses with insufficient bricks. Yeah, and I mean... It's a bit scary, really, when you when you throw out some of those some of those statistics. It's, it's and, terrifying. Well, I'm just thinking about my own cupboard in the kitchen and and what the kind of ratio of process to whole foods is. And you know, it's just, of course, there are cost considerations. It's much mm -hmm. cheaper for people to go and buy processed food. But even then, it's it's just desire wise. When we go to the supermarkets, we've got nine of the aisles filled with processed food and one with the whole foods in it. I'm, Desire, I'm wondering I mean, a couple opportunity access, all of those things. Yeah. All of those, yeah. all of those things. I mean, there's two questions that come to mind here. The first mm -hmm. is around if we are obviously in an ideal world, we're getting all those nutrients from whole foods, uh -huh. healthy, clean, whole foods. If that's not possible for whatever reason, whether it be cost related access or just really good advertising <laughs> does can we supplement what we're missing? I mean, is there's you know huge multi-billion pound industry around supplements and and mm -hmm. you know taking many of the things you've described in pill form rather than in the foods themselves. Does that cut it? Does that make up some of the gap, or do we really need to focus on eating those whole uh, and healthy foods? So, <laughs> and this is where you know people will rightly say, oh, you talk about supplements, but the supplements have haven't been shown to do anything, and they are right in a particular instance. So if you are eating a broadly healthy diet, and that we could leave that up to whatever interpretation makes sense, then it's absolutely true that supplementation really isn't doing very much for you. So taking a, you know, a multivitamin probably on top of a healthy diet isn't doing much because it's like, if you've got an empty tank and you put petrol in the car, 
fantastic. It doesn't help to put try and put an extra gallon on top of a full tank. It's excessive. It's unnecessary. So the body will um, just expel that anything that's over and above well, what it needs. Well, when it comes to water soluble vitamins like the B vitamins and vitamin C, it can expel them. But if it's a fat soluble vitamin like vitamin A, vitamin D, then it can build up. It can accumulate. It yeah, can accumulate right. and and, right. and can become toxic. Toxicity is rare, but it's it's possible. So, and and the reason that you know they talk about the prison studies is that in that case. In this particular case, we're talking about a population that, A, the food in prison is pretty terrible. So they're not meeting nutritional intake of a kind of healthy, balanced diet that's set up by the government. But also they come from histories. Most of the people who are in prison will come from a background of some kind of deprivation where they've had a very long term poor nutritional status. And so in Mm -hmm. that case, we see these quite remarkable effects. But we're less likely if we took a group of healthy, wealthy people to see those kinds of effects. So I think it depends very much on the population you're talking about as to how much influence supplementation can have. But the other thing to say is that there are dozens, potentially thousands of compounds in plant foods that simply cannot, have not been identified or could not be replicated in a lab in order to put them in a pill. So mm. the compounds and that you'll find in an apple in a matrix with fiber and all of that stuff, we can't replicate an apple in a pill. So right. you might be able to fill some gaps, but you're not going to get the full abundance and variety and diversity of nutrients and so not just your vitamins and minerals, but those plant compounds, which we understand to be beneficial as well from supplementation. Mm, mm. So the kind of, I guess the bottom line is go for the healthy balance diet. Eat, eat some beans. <laughs> but yeah, but if you if you are in a situation where you can't eat a, a certain type of food, maybe it's allergy related or, or you know sure. another illness that you have, then you can always look to supplements to to fill. Yes, that gap I think I think yeah. there are certain cases where it makes sense, and certainly if you have um, an allergy or you have a diet of exclusion in some way, or even so there's some research that indicates that if you're going through a stressful period. So let's say you're an accountant and it's year end or something like that. If you know you're coming up to a deadline or a stressful period, supplementation can help with stress resilience. Mm. It can help to mitigate the effects of that stress so you tolerate it better and it has a less negative effect on your mood and your sleep quality. So, you know, certain populations, maybe certain times, and again, certain times in the lifespan, pregnancy, and there are real cases to take on nutrients because there is higher demand or there is a more an increased likelihood of, of deficiency. I want to go a little bit further into that because mm. it's the first time I've heard, of course, during periods of stress, we might take an immune booster a bit more often, right? Because we know we're feeling run down. And as we said earlier, that connection between being stressed and the body, that side of the feedback loop is a bit better understood than the other side of it. Could you speak a little bit more to that? So if I've got a deadline coming up or I know I'm going to be working, you know, a bunch of late nights over the next few weeks, are there very specific supplementation I should be looking at? Or does it also depend on on my diet and on on my kind of, on my context there? Well, I mean, what's really fascinating about this stuff is that the the kind so when you're exploring, investigating a new nutritional treatment or any, any intervention. So let's say I was developing a new uh, antidepressant. I wouldn't test it against placebo because we know that there are drugs that work. So I would test it against the next best thing. So if I were developing a new medication, I would test it against the next best medication. And I would Mm -hmm. be trying to see whether it is as good as or better than that thing. When they do that with nutrition studies that look at stress resilience, the next best thing is Barocca. So there's really actually well-established evidence that B vitamins, which are absolutely essential for neuronal health, so much so that when you are deficient in B vitamins, your deficiency symptoms show up as neuronal issues, as neurocognitive and neuropsychiatric conditions, issues Mm. around aggression, um, mood disorder, irritability, poor memory, risks for dementia, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So your B vitamins and the entire complex of B vitamins are essential for neuronal health. And when people take them, and you might have seen the research a few years ago that said like Marmite can help your anxiety. <laughs> yeah, Again, yeah. Marmite is rich in B vitamins. So it seems to be at the very least getting a good complement of B vitamins seems to be supportive for stress resilience. 
Now, in the study that I'm thinking about, so the study title is um, Shaken But Unstirred, and it looked at people. There was a, a huge earthquake in New Zealand in 2010, 2011. Yeah, Christchurch, yeah. Yes. And there was a study already ongoing into micronutrient supplementation, so vitamins and minerals. And then the and then the earthquake happened. And so essentially they had this group of people, some who were on nutrients and some who weren't, who were dealing with this huge stressful event. And so what they did was to basically turn that into the study. And the outcome was was absolutely fascinating. The people who were taking the nutrients were less likely to have intrusive thoughts. They had less severity of anxiety and they were less likely to develop PTSD than those who are not taking the nutrients. And I think that th that is around, again, understanding that your brain is made of nutrients, but also that all of your neurotransmitters and your stress hormones are made of nutrients, right? So we talk about serotonin, we talk about dopamine, and yes, some people will think, you know, tryptophan or tyrosine, the amino acid, you need to have enough of to turn, to become a, um, a neurotransmitter. But let's say with the example of serotonin, if you want to take tryptophan, which is an amino acid, a piece of a protein, and turn it into serotonin, and that that is your, it's a factory, and this is your kind of conveyor belt, all of the workers who are doing that job are nutrients. You mm -hmm. need nutrients to do that conversion in order to make your neurotransmitters. The thing that happens when you have a stressful experience is that cortisol, your stress hormone, is your alarm system. There's our evolutionary high alert, all hands on deck. This is a nightmare. We need to survive alarm system. And so what will happen is that, and this is called the, the triage theory of nutrients, is that the stress pathways, the stress hormone pathways will get first dibs on your nutrients in yep. order to keep you going, to keep you alive. Your, you know, your, your brain doesn't care or your brain body doesn't care whether you're happy or whether you have a libido. If we're in a crisis situation, you can have sex later. We need to survive first is what it <laughs> yeah. says. Right? Yeah. And so evolution has said, send all the resources to managing the stress. And what that means is if you haven't got sufficient nutrition on, on hand, then you might then have insufficient nutritional stores to make your serotonin, to make mm. your dopamine, to make that acetylcholine. And when we look at the functions of those neurotransmitters, we're talking about mood regulation. We're talking about motivation and drive, pleasure. We're talking about learning and memory. And so in this way, I think is the way that chronic stress can lay those foundations for later yeah. depression is that it's yeah. depriving your brain and your body of what it needs to keep it ticking over and keep it feeling well whilst it tries to deal with the emergency. Yeah. So it's, I mean, immune system is affected greatly as well, um, because in that yes, stress response, absolutely. we're not concerned about whether we'll get sick next week. It's about mm -hmm. staying alive today. And you said it there that, that you know, the brain also doesn't distinguish between a real or, per or perceived threat. So mm -hmm. it's a wonderful response to have when we are in a real threat situation, but when it is an email from the boss or an argument with the partner, and we respond in the same way yeah. that we would if we're faced with, you know, a grizzly bear or something, it's no good for us at all, is it? I love the analogy used of the factory workers being the nutrients that are doing that conversion. And when the alarm bells ring, they all just rush off the factory floor and run, that is run out, <laughs> run out to the, you know, assembly area in the front of the of the factory. That is Fascinating. exactly it. So, so when in doubt, going back to the the kind of the the, the early part of the script, when in doubt. Keep some Barocca around. Is that what you're saying? For, yeah, for those you know, and, and I, I have to, you know, let everybody know I'm not sponsored by Barocca. <laughs> there are no, I don't care about Mama. But it's a I'm open. Thing. I'm open to being sponsored by Barocca. <laughs> let me say that here. Um, but it's about broadly, yes, making sure you've got sufficient nutrition to deal with the stress response, the survival response, and provide your brain with what it needs to keep ticking over. Yeah, wonderful. I want to get to, and I think you've already shared many, but I want to come back to just, you know, a few practical, what are your top mm. tips that you do, do give people? Before that, the second question I had when you were describing that nutrition, brain development, you know, 
connection is then going one step further to mental health. So mm. if, if the brain is slightly underdeveloped, if some of those building blocks were not there and you've got areas of the brain that, that, that haven't been developed the way they should, how does that then translate? So it's kind of obvious to me how it could translate to a lower IQ. And it's amazing mm -hmm. to think that people living on coasts may just be smarter than people living inland just by virtue of their diets. That's mm. amazing. But how does that translate then into potential, you know, mental health vulnerabilities in mm -hmm. early or, or, or later life? Because the, the most honest answer is that we don't know for sure. Mm. This is still very kind of early research. What we do have, for example, is a range of both associations and interventions. So we know, for example, from many, many hundreds of thousands of, of people that essentially a dose-related response, which is healthier your diet, the less likely you are to convert into depression and the less severe that depression will be. Mm. And then we have some of the early intervention studies which have looked at improving diet in people who already have what would be considered clinically a poor diet. So it's not taking someone with a great diet and adding more vitamins. It's taking someone with a standard American or Western style diet and improving it in line with either a Mediterranean or a kind of more whole foods uh, intake. Mm -hmm. And there are improvements. There are questions around that still, you know, is it the purely the nutrition or is it that you see someone every week who's interested in you and that, that helps I think that's still being worked out but we do again have these very interesting mechanisms so it's about bringing all of those things together so for example we know from pretty robust meta-analyses that there is an association between um, omega-3 supplementation and and depression such that uh, supplementation of about a gram a day of omega-3 where about at least 60% of the supplement is EPA and less of the DHA is protective or helps to reduce depression. A lot of these studies will then kind of speculate on that mechanism. And one of them might be around inflammation because mm. EPA is absolutely essential to the task of turning off inflammation. Yeah. And again, most of us aren't eating enough omega-3 rich foods in order to have that. So there's a possibility that our low intake of omega-3 uh, rich foods is associated with what is our leading cause of global disability, which is mood disorders. Yeah. And, and, and on, the, on the flip side, the ultra processed food is causing inflammation. So we, we've got, you know, we're eating food on the one hand that's causing inflammation and not eating the food that can help to lower that inflammation. And that Inflammation, I think, is a, I speak from personal experience, having had a, a chronic health condition for over a decade. When inflammation is there, mood is, I mean, the impact on mood is incredible. And when you're not aware of it, like many of us are not because we're up in mm. our heads all the time, we're not mm. in our bodies. We go on eating those things, we go on inflaming the system, and, and then next thing you know, we're, you know, we're lashing out at, at those we love and making all kinds of bad, bad decisions. Mm. Sorry, I cut you off there. I wanted to see if you want to finish your, your train mm. of thought. No, I, uh, the train has left the station. No, it's... Okay. <laughs> so just the omega-3s, and then the fact that you said it should, you know, 60% EPA. Um... Yes. Oh, so there's the other thing. Uh, so other potential mechanisms, for example, certainly one that I'm particularly interested in, and I have this unofficial campaign on my Instagram, it's called Eat More Beans. Hashtag Eat More Beans. And the reason, <laughs> and again, not sponsored by Big Bean, the reason is that we so we have chronically low fiber intakes in the UK. There isn't a single age group that is meeting the fiber recommendation. Only 9% of people in the UK, adults or children, are, are meeting that fiber recommendation. And so aside from all the stuff that we know and talk about the gut microbiome doing, all this wonderful stuff that it does, making vitamins, neurotransmitters, speaking to your immune system, protecting the lining of your gut, it actually also does something really, I think, wonderful for your brain so when your microbiome breaks down fiber one of the byproducts is a group of compounds a group of fatty acids and we've been speaking about the long fatty acids these short chain fatty acids uh, are produced as a byproduct of microbial fermentation and what they do a is protect the lining of the gut which is great thank you for helping us reduce our risk of inflammation but they mm -hmm. also cross into the bloodstream travel up to the brain and they help to protect the tight junctions of the blood-brain barrier. 
So the blood brain barrier is a very highly specialized, very important, very selective barrier that around the brain that separates the brain, the brain tissue from the bloodstream. And it's important to do that because you could have eaten anything. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you could have you know, all been exposed to anything. And what we don't want is for any kind of toxic compound crossing into the brain because the brain is very sensitive to intruders because even immune cells from the peripheral body can't make it through because your brain has its own immune system so if anything crosses in it triggers these microglia and you have a neuroinflammatory response we know that neuroinflammation is associated with a range of neuropsychiatric disorders including bipolar disorder schizophrenia and depression Mm. and so and we know also talking about inflammation that cytokines high levels of circulating cytokines can uh, impair this tight junction function, junction function of the blood brain barrier. <laughs> New hashtag um, there. <laughs> okay. Um, and so there is a potential, and I'll look into it because I'm like, what about this mechanism? I don't think enough people are talking about it. But there's this kind of potential role or absence of a protective role from our persistently low fiber intakes, which means that we are not getting that BBB protection and the issue with that is not just the inflammation but that we know for sure that uh, impaired bbb integrity is one of the early markers of precursor and potentially a driver of alzheimer's disease and alzheimer's Mm. disease happens to be our leading cause of death in the uk Mm. so uh, there is there's a lot to be picked out food as with all parts of biology is very, very complex. And it has lots of constituent parts that might interact with each other and then interact with your genes and then interact with your microbiome and so on. So there is a huge amount to understand. But I think what is very clear is that we know that poor diet globally is a leading cause of of death and ill health in terms of its association with heart disease and hypertension and certain cancers. But we cannot then ignore that the brain is going to be involved there as well. You know, Mm. a a poor diet isn't just bad for your blood vessels in your peripheral body. It's going to be bad for the blood vessels in your brain. Mm. We know, for example, that diabetes significantly increases, that type 2 diabetes significantly increases your risk of dementia. You know, that there are all of these associations between a poor, inadequate, fiber-poor diet and physical and increasingly the evidence is showing neurological concerns. Wow. Just personally, I've got a lot to go away and think about now. (laughs) Restock the kitchen and the supplement cupboard. I think you've given tons of tips in terms of, you know, whether it's for mothers to be, you know, watching the processed food to whole food ratio, more fiber, Mm -hmm. beans, hashtag, um, the the junction function. Let's improve the junction (laughs) function. So uh, to end, maybe you could share with us what's exciting you at the moment? What projects are you working on that have got you you know, kind of tingling and excited um, about? Well, actually, I mean, I literally just had a, a meeting with my team. <laughs> there are about 300 people out there who about four years ago signed up to a newsletter <laughs> that has never emerged. I thought, yes, newsletter, that'd be great. That'd be interesting. I can talk a bit more and in depth than I can on my Instagram. And then just books and things and clinical in the way. But my newsletter is brand new. It's going to be out. I don't know when this is going out, but it's out on the, I think we decided next Thursday, the first Thursday in October. What is that? The fifth? That is the fifth. Yes. Fifth of October. So I'm very excited and I'm literally, I'm planning on theming the sessions, theming the newsletter every month. And the first month I think I'm going to do on taste and flavor and the mechanics of taste and flavor and the relationship between Mm. that and our food choices. But I'm definitely going to do a month on beans as well. So (laughs) that's my newsletter coming out. And then really what I want to be doing, what I'm going to be doing over the next few months is working on a a practical resource because I think self-help books are good. You know, I wrote one. (laughs) I think they're helpful. They give you information. But I think as a practicing psychologist, what I know is that behavior change is very difficult. And actually, mm-hmm. you need some support, some guidance, someone to check in with. And so, and the other thing that I'm very concerned about and that I'm seeing more and more is people saying, I'm just, I'm waiting, I'm waiting, I'm waiting. And while I'm waiting for my GP to get back to me or to get onto a treatment group, I had someone waiting for 
in ADHD assessment, specialist assessment for over 18 months. And it was okay because that person was coming to me and I could offer them kind of support along the way away while they waited, but not everybody has that access. So I want to be able to try and create something that provides people a little bit more support, that's a bit more proactive, that is a bit more preventative because we really marginalize mental health when it comes to prevention. We do prevention with physical health, you know, brush your teeth, not because you're already wearing dentures, but because we want to prevent caries and gum disease. Don't smoke because we want to prevent lung cancer. But when it comes to mental health, we're just like, well, let's see how you go. If you get sick, then come and see us and we'll try and bring you back to baseline. And what I want is hopefully to create a resource which is uh, preventative, mental health prevention in some way. So I, I don't have anything just yet, but that's what's ticking over. Okay, so watch this space for that one. And I suppose yeah. that developments on that will be announced in the newsletter as well, won't they? So yeah. how do people how do, how do people sign up for your newsletter then? Well, so hopefully there will be a button on my page imminently. <laughs> so if you go to Kimberly Wilson, so it's Kimberly with an L-E-Y dot C-O, that should take you to the main hub. Or you can follow me on Instagram, which is food and psych. And I will obviously announce and do swipe ups and chit chat and jibber jabber there to keep people updated and informed. Brilliant. Well, we'll put links to those in the show notes. And uh, yeah, that brings us to, I mean, I feel like we could have gone on for a lot longer, but it's also like a got potential for a multi-part series. There's just so much to this. <laughs> so I might be back in touch with you, Kimberly. <laughs> just l- let me thank you again. This has been, for me personally, I'm sure for anyone who's listening, just so informative and quite inspiring, actually, about the just the potential benefits of making these changes, which are you know, they're not that hard to make. They're not that hard to make, are yeah. they? So really, yeah, really appreciate you sharing, not just with me, but with the world or, or everything you've learned and synthesizing that into a, a more easily digestible uh, format. Thank you. No, my absolute pleasure. And I'm glad it, it feels inspirational and not terrifying. I know there's some scary stuff in there, but I want people to know that there's more power in our hands than we think, particularly when it comes to our minds and our brain health. So, you know, power to the people. Wonderful. Thank you, Kimberly. Thanks so Thank much. Thank you. Thanks again for listening to the Back to Being podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, you can subscribe or follow to receive news about future shows. Till next time, be kind to yourself and others. I wish you well.